All right, Julie. Hi. Hi. My name is Rich Breimer. I'm uh, here with Julie Hoke at Carmel Visual Arts tonight. We are going to be doing a cloudscape demonstration with uh, Julie's uh, going to be doing oils. And it's going to be a two-part demo. Um, the first part, she's going to begin a demo. Um, but then she's going to also work on a painting that has been created uh, over the last few, say, days. Uh, and that will be um, like the cooking shows when you pull up the cake out of the oven and then you frost it, but you've just made it. So anyway, there will be a two-part <laughs> two uh, painting demo. It will be really exciting. Um, this, uh, this will be archived uh, on YouTube for a while, so all you all can watch it again and get as much out of it as you want to or can. And uh, so that's it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. Um, I'm going to demo how I do my um, studio skies. And um, just to recap, this is, um, I normally start with a very large, large piece of linen, oil primed, double primed linen. That's all I use, Belgian oil primed, double primed lumen. And um, the surface of the oil is what helps me give the luminosity. And if you go and try to do a lot of what I'm doing, with acrylic primed canvases, you're going to find that it's a little bit more like pushing a box through mud. It's going to have a lot of grab to it. You're not going to be able to get the same sort of slide, same sort of finish. And um, not that you can't use acrylic, it's just uh, has more resistance to it. And because it has more tooth and it's drier, it'll absorb the paint more. Whereas the oil primed, especially the double primed oil, will allow the paint to stand up on top of it. And also because the light will go in go through the oil paint, hit that oil priming, bounce back out and refract. So all of that, it's like little prisms, all right? So that works for you in something like luminescent skies, <laughs> okay? So I would normally tone my panels or my canvas and I, pet, I tone them all different kinds of different colors. It's not necessarily this peachy color, but I just chose that for this particular instance. Um, I don't ever tone in anything like brown or red or blue. It's always something that would be something that, and it's a sky that you might find in the sky. Okay, so but I don't, I don't tone it dark or gray or anything. It's always like a peach or a pink. Could be yellow. Could be toward the violet. Could be something cool like that. It all depends on what time of day and the mood that I want. So I want to talk a little bit about the colors that I'm using. The palette, which is different from my regular oil painting palette. And I've laid the colors out here so you can see them and they correspond to basically what's happening up here on the palette. So there tends to be a lot of gambling colors here. It's a good workhorse. It's a good solid brand. Like it's dependable. It's not, it's not a student grade paint, which I like. And um, it's also not so pricey that you can't afford to, to use it. <laughs> okay, So that's good. It has good flow. So um, my limited palette is basically a warm and cool color of red, yellow, blue, some earth colors. And then I use the Gamblin Radiance. And we've got Radiant Yellow, Radiant Blue, Radiant Magenta, Radiant Violet, Radiant Green, Radiant Turquoise, Radiant Red. Okay, I use those for my skies. Um, not that you can't use them for other things, but they're great kind of pre-mixed mixes that you can go to that allow you to get good chroma, good color intensity, and also a high key value, which is what you're trying to do in skies is you also want to keep them floating in the air. You don't want them sinking like a stone. And along here I have some pre-mixed grays, which I rarely use except when I am actually painting a sky. And they are also Gamblin grays. There's a dark gray. There's a warm, cool gray. There is a um, medium, cool gray. And then there's um, a, a cool gray. So all of these are here. And they're all up here. You can come and take a picture of this later if you just want to download quickly what it looks like. You don't have to write all these down. Um, I also use black and white when I want a neutral gray without any kind of color or any kind of color shift. So that's another good, good go-to color if you just want to mix a gray and know that it's not going to be warm or cool. Okay, so <clears throat> um, how do I start? I rarely use brushes. I use Viva towels. Okay. Why do I use Viva towels? <laughs> because um, they, first of all, they don't pill. Um, unless they, you really break them down. They give a nice little you know, kind of movement to them. And because clouds are soft, there are no hard edges in a cloud. Okay, so I want to keep it soft. If I lay it in a direct sky, 
Like I have some of my other paintings here, like this is direct. You're going to see a lot of hard edges. It's a very different way of painting. And when I do these skies, I do it in a lot of transparent layers, a lot of very thin paint. And so I want to be able to control that. I want to also keep it very organic and very loose. So I can also soften my edges, move paint around. So this really becomes a brush. So how you use it depends on the kind of brush. You can make it very you know, direct, or you can actually kind of wad it and sort of make it a little softer. So you have a whole different tool here <laughs> to use. So um, first thing I'm going to do is um, make up a sky. And I'm just going to go in and I'm going to use a little of my solvent, which is odorless mineral spirits. And um, I have to first of all decide where my light direction is, where my sun is, where I want it to be. And that's really important for what I'm thinking about how I'm going to design this. So um, let's put it somewhere over in here. So I'm going to Just start moving some paint around. So you using turp or is that oil? This is not turp, it is odorless mineral spirits. Oh, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's Gamsol. Yeah. So when I'm laying this in, I'm thinking about positive and negative space, thinking about the dynamics of a sky where the light's going to, the cloud is going to be softer. And down here, it's going to fade into the horizon. And my light is going to be over here. So I can leave these edges a little bit softer. And because this is where my light's going to be, kind of like a rim light or a halo light, you see that in a lot of my work. You'll see that in this piece here. OK? So um, where that hard edge is is going to create is also where my focal point is. So I can use that technique to draw your eye to my focal point. So keeping some of these edges here a little bit stiffer on this side is actually achieved best with the towel. And there was really no right or wrong when it comes to clouds, because everything happens up in the sky. The one thing you want to do is make sure that um, you don't end up with parallel lines. You don't end up with Mickey Mouse ears. You don't end up, once somebody, I did this huge painting, and somebody walked in and said, oh, there's a horse in the sky. Oh. So you have to watch out for things like bunny rabbits, because what you do is these are like Rorschach tests. Your eye and your brain get comfortable <laughs> with a shape, and then it repeats it. All right. So we want to make sure that we don't end up with something like that. And I don't, it's just something that our brain does. If you get an area when you're first laying this in that's a little too stiff, you can just take a little solvent and you can say, I want to change that. I want to cut into this and make this a little less whatever, a little less symmetrical with that side. So you have a, really, a lot of control with laying this in. You don't get locked in. You don't want to get locked in. You want to give yourself a lot of different latitude for a lot of different freedom in how you do this. This towel lasts. And you can also turn it. But when it gets too funky, you, know, you notice that I've got a whole stack of them here. You just toss it out. OK, so now the other thing that I've got to do here is because I have to, everything is in relation to everything else. I can't really keep on designing much more of this until I put in some of my positive space, which is what's going on down here. That also is going to help me determine the values of my sky. So I'm going to take a brush. And again, I'm going to think about where my focal point is. If I keep it over here, I want to make sure that when I make your eye go back with the land, that I don't end you up over here. Okay, so I have to think about a visual pathway. So 
let's just go I do a lot of marshlands. So let's create something that will support the sky. And if you're getting a little too much of this, you can also take your towel and make just a few corrections on that too. And the horizon line is never hard, never a hard edge. You want to soften these edges at this stage because if they're hard you will have a very hard time getting them to look soft down the road. You can always make it harder. It's a lot more difficult to soften it or to go in and soften some to repaint over something that's a hard edge. It's sort of like stuck and um, you'll end up putting a lot of paint on there just to try to get rid of something and overcompensating for it. So it's all Keep your edges soft. Always restate it to make it stronger. Okay, so here I've sort of got this. I'm going to work a little bit on the aerial perspective just so I feel a little more comfortable with what's going on down here. that this is water. So it's going to help us just to put some of that in. Because whatever's happening up here is going to be reflected in whatever's down here. And also at this stage you can move things in, cut into your shape here. It doesn't have to be exactly the way you laid it in, you can move in a little more water the way you want it. Okay, that's enough for that. We don't really want to spend all our time developing that, but that's enough information for me to make decisions on what else I want to do up here. So, time to get a new towel. It's sort of like getting a new brush because I've already done one passage and laying this in. I'm going to put a little bit of blue tone in the sky. And I'm using just straight radiant blue. And I'm using it right over this peach. And I will keep it transparent because one way you can create the feeling of light in your sky is to let your underpainting show through. And also because this is where my light is, the sky is going to fall off over here. So this part of the sky is going to be a little bit darker and this part of the sky is going to be a little bit lighter. You can also take your sky and at this point soften and go in and start playing with the positive shapes of your clouds. So I can then kiss some of that over there. So you don't want these edges to butt up against each other like two goat heads. So you can also feather some of that in and get them to relate to one another just by controlling the edges. 
Now this is going to be dark over here because the light is here, it's falling off over here. So I'm going to use a little bit one of my grays actually into this mix. And just bring that part of the sky down a little bit. Okay. So now I'm going to work on sort of how I'm going to develop this particular cloud. So I'm going to go into some of my chromatic gray mixes right here. And clouds are like, they're three-dimensional, even though you can fly through them. They're, they're not so, so, they're solid in a sense, but they're not like, like glasses or things that are objects that are opaque. You can go through them. So light comes through them, but inside these clouds, there are other cloud shapes that sit on top of them. And it's constantly changing, so it's, it's not just like a cross-section, like a flat wall that you're painting. You've got the dimensionality of these things popping out. You've got some shapes in front of others. And some of the shapes are softer and they're different colors. It almost looks like cotton balls sometimes in the sky that you've got it stuck all together. So I want to think about the fact that right now I've painted a wall. So how do I get some dimension to that? How do I get some things in front of this wall? So I'm again thinking about this particular area here. And I'm working away from the light a little bit. And as the light moves away, it's going to get slightly darker. This side of the cloud will be slightly darker. But I don't want to paint it like a line. This is not like going around and outlining it, which is another reason I'm using this, because it keeps it really organic. It seems like there's no control, but you actually have more control, but in a much freer way. It's like the difference between t paying tight or loose. <laughs> When people paint loose, they actually have a lot of control, but they have to, the, the tightness that they have in, internally is allowing them to be loose. Um, so this keeps me from getting this too tight. It keeps me from trying to draw it like an actual thing. I'm going to introduce some of these radiants. And you notice I'm using like wet into wet. Or like if you, this were a brush, I'm going into one mix over another mix and I'm mixing on the palette. So it's, it really does become a brush. And if you try this, don't be afraid to like let the paint just do, do what it does. You may not get exactly what you think you're going to get, but you may get something brand new and exciting and you'll learn from it. So just dive in and just sort of see. You can't do this formulaically. You have to just get in and understand color and value and light. And where do you want to do it? How do you move it around? And that actually makes it a very fun process. So just like a brush, if you're going wet into wet, you're going to be mixing wet into wet on your actual painting. Can you try to um, paint a little bit to the side? Because even on the film, it's a little, yeah. Is that helping? Yeah. Okay. So if you take these radiants, you can make some very interesting grays with them. that are not solid grays, but are quite luminescent.
There's some little high clouds off in here. You want to think about the horizon. I'm going to key that in as being lighter. As the light's coming down here. It's going to be hitting all of this here. So those of you that know my work can see those big luminous sky paintings that I do. They all start in some form like this. And those paintings probably have 40 or 50 passages of paint on them when I'm done. One thing you can do is you can then take a dry part of your towel and you can flick the light on the rim. Instead of just dragging it this way, you can cross hatch it across, soften that edge. I'm using white and I'm using a yellow, yellow, the lemon yellow mixed together. So over here, there's light is falling over on these guys, so we don't want to forget these guys over here. So you're not using the radiant yellow? I didn't use the radiant yellow. I used the Windsor yellow in the white, but I can use the radiant yellow. I use. Um, do you want to see, what, see me use the radiant mm -hmm. yellow? <laughs> okay. 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 I'll figure out a way to put it in here, okay? It's just fun to know what you're using. Okay, all right. Well, feel free to call out any time and I will tell you if I'm, tell you what I'm doing. I just mixed the um, radiant magenta with the cad yellow dark and some white to get this peachy color. Can you say that again, please? I used the um, radiant magenta and the cad yellow dark and some white to get this peachy color. Now you can at this stage, which is just something I might normally do a couple stages down, but I just want to show you you can, since the light is going to be spilling here, put in some of your reflective light, and you can just go wet into wet over the top of that.
Now I'm using just pure white because I've got so much pigment on here now, I don't need to add more color. I just need to bring the value up. So I'm kind of going um, in and actually carving in more of a few breaks in these clouds to create some more drama at this stage. I'm sort of trying to push this along as fast as I can for you so I can show you as much as what I might get done um, at this stage before I have to stop because it just has to set up. Otherwise, it just starts falling apart. There's a point in this that you have to let it dry down. Um, otherwise, when you're working wet into wet like this, you're just going to kill everything that you've done. You've got to let it dry down, and you've got to go in and you've got to restate, and then you've got to go back in, and then you've got to develop it. When I bring up the next panel, you'll see how I've taken that, and you, you'll get a better handle on what that actually means in terms of your actual work. So I got to go in and clean up the sky a little bit because it's, it needs a little more information. And I can also, at this time, decide if I want to work my edges here a little bit. And if I want to amputate some of my cloud, I can do that by cutting in at this stage. Um, and by using your finger, you get a much more organic feel rather than going in with a brush. A brush, you're going to get something that is almost a little controlled and looks, looks like you did it with a brush. It doesn't have that natural feeling. You, there's going to be that little bit of sense of the happy accident with this process, but that's actually what you want. The more you work with it, the better you get at it. And then you look at something like that and you go, you could never get that with a brush. <laughs> okay. So um, then there are times when it works against you and it's, you don't have the control with the brush, but um, you have to always can go back to the brush to rein it in if you need to. Now we're going to put a little... Does anyone have a question at this stage at all about anything? Do you have a path of using this purely from your head? Do you have a place your mind as a reference, or you're just this is from my head? That's a good question. This is from my head. I didn't bring a photograph. Mm -hmm. um, I have a lot of pictures in my head of clouds, mm -hmm. and, and I know the subject pretty well, so I can create it and know what makes sense up there and put it here. Um, did this ever exist? I don't know. Maybe it did. Probably, but this not is precisely, but like not precisely. But I see this all the t I see yeah. this sort of thing all the time. Yeah, and um, I'm highly influenced by wetlands and estuaries and waterways, and so this ubiquity of that sort of landscape um, tends to repeat itself in many, many different parts of the country. Yeah. At this stage, there's a lot of color in here. And I will use, um, this is not the final paint layer, but I will leave a lot of those colors in there. And then when I do my second pass, those colors are underneath. Um, so don't be afraid of the color. Okay, you want, you want that. Um, and there, there are instances where you, I'll go and I'll put like something with that radiant green in there, and all of a sudden, you, that there was green actually in the sky because it's reflecting what's on the land, right? If you have green land, you have green in your sky. If you have blue water, you have blue in your sky. If you have brown in your land, you have brown in your sky. So all of that is bounced back. And if you're working with color, and you've got purpley, pinky tones, and if you put greeny in your sky and a little bit, that's going to create a color temperature relationship. So that synergistic <coughs> feeling of how do you induce the feeling of light and luminosity and that sort of color and feeling without looking drab, you've got to work color, temperature, warm and cool, and work with that so synergy and the color in order to create that. So um, the chroma is going to give you that. Now I've got these little bits of the backdrop coming through here. And I want to keep a lot of that because that looks like light. That looks like the cloud. That gives me that transparency to it. So I am going to clean some of this up a little bit. And you can take a dry part of your towel and you can just 
soften some of these relationships. I want a little band of white coming through here. A little band of high key something. So these d fellows down here are the lower lying clouds. You can soften a lot of them, drag them down. You, want to, you also remember, want to remember your peripheral perspective, which is the side to side in your painting. You don't want these to end up in hard edges. So you want to bring some of these down here. You want to keep your eye and everything moving this way, right? So if you have all this light stuff Super highways going off this way, eyes are going to go off, off the painting. So you don't want that. And you can even think in terms of if this were a squall line, those edges would practically disappear. And you would have the line coming down like that, right? So this little cloud is in front of this mass here, and so there's an edge of it that's going to be a little lighter at the top, and I'm defining that right now because the light's coming down is going to hit it. So I want to make that one stick out a little bit. I'm too close to it. Um, you do want to step back from your work and look at it um, from about 10 feet at least. Um, I'm going to restate this in here. Remember, this is where my light is. This is where my, this part of the sky where I'm going to have more light coming. So let's develop that just a little. I'm getting pretty close to the place where if this were still this were a painting in the studio, I would be stopping and letting all this set up. And how long does it take to set up? It's a day. It's pretty thin. It's pretty thin. I usually let it sit a day. I in the studio I have three easels going at once, and they're large. So I'll I'll do one, then I'll work half an hour on another one, then I'll move to another one. And maybe after lunch, the first one is ready for another pass. Depends on how thick it is. And um, like right in here, I've got this thicker impasto stuff, which I'm going to leave because I want, so that may not be dry, but um, some of this other stuff may be dry. Uh, but in order to do the next layer, it has to be totally dry. Otherwise, it's, I'm going to lose everything I've, I've stated here because I'm doing, working wet into wet. Um, this I'm going to develop a little bit more before we stop. And this is one of those little renegade clouds, which you can really have fun with these fellows. What you want to make sure of is you never have an even number, OK? And you never line them up like people on a bus, OK? <laughs> so they're never all go see dough. You want to make sure that there's all this, they create some sort of tension. So in the, something like this, OK, you want to focal point. All this is leading over here. So this is off center. So that's good. It didn't center it. That's one hurdle overcome. But then this is also one of those things where you don't want to end up with it looking like it's too you know, evenly weighted. So these sort of things are out there just to give a little tension. It's like the branch on a tree that's going this way and everybody else is going this way. And all of a sudden, you've got 
one bird on one side of the tree and three over here. It's that that gives you some sort of something that, that, that tips the tension of it. And also watch your edges at this stage. So I'm going to, instead of this ending right here, it's sort of like a line, I'm going to move this cloud up here and soften it and work on my aerial perspective. So this falls off on this edge. So I'm going to keep your eye moving this way. So I don't want this part of the painting to become overly chromatic or colorful or dramatic because this is supporting this. Now this I haven't developed fully yet because I can't. Because if I do, I have to have all this more developed before I go in there and do my last little hurrah, sort of that bit. But I'm setting it up for that. This I want to keep pulling some chroma, some subordinate chroma, because the light's moving off and falling off this way as well as coming back down here. So, you know, where the light is in this painting is it could be up behind these clouds and shooting this way. So there's also kissing some rim light on these fellows. But I want to just keep this all soft in here. So does a painting, say, take two to three days to complete? Two to three months. <laughs> A big painting, like a 50 by 50. Yeah. But, but this painting, yeah. if it were this size, um, this would probably take me with this process um, a couple weeks to get it the way I wanted it to be. Yeah. Just you know it's so thin. It's thin so I can do the layers. So if I'm doing it opaquely, this is a good question, then it's, it's like going in and deciding to paint your living room blue instead of green, it, you don't see the green anymore, right, if you've done it right. So this, what I want is I want each pass to add to what's on top of it. So they want another to still talk to each other. Because what I start doing in the upper layers is I'll start burnishing. I'll start subtracting paint and then adding paint. So there's almost sometimes where I'm burnishing the surface, the surface, getting down to one or two layers and laying them, putting them and adding in. So that's where I get those top layers. Then I decide where I want to move something in and out. And that's where I'm in the very last refining. It's like, think of it as woodworking. You've got all the carving, the gross figures, and then they're, they're chipping away, and they've got the form. And then they're down the very final stages, and they're polishing it. And they know they have to take off. You have to take off a little bit of what you've cut into in order to polish it to get that surface. That's the same with this process. So it's, and it's hard to show. It's time consuming, but it's a really fun way to work. <laughs> so I have fun with it. And um, there's, I have a limitless supply of subject matter out there. And um, sometimes I don't paint the way it looks, I paint the way it feels, or the way it sounds, to get myself out of that locked in, it's a preconceived, this is what a cloud looks saying to get it, it, that sort of happy accident looseness to allow myself not to get too tight with it because it's when I allow the freedom to come through where I let the process work for me instead of fighting it trying to control it too much that's when I get those things where people go how did you get that how did you get that stroke right well it's only because you know I allowed myself to go in and go <sighs> okay and then just let it go right so there has to be a little bit of that jumping off the diving board for this. And I enjoy that. <laughs> and what's the worst that can happen? If you don't like it, you rub it out. <laughs> okay, I'm of a mind to sort of stop right here and let this set up. Um, because I'd like to show you how you take it to the next level. Anyone have... This is does anyone have a question? Would you talk about the biggest mistakes you can make in the first sort of process? Getting your edges too hard, too fast. Getting your edges hard, getting too dark too quickly. And putting on too heavy layer of paint. And if you do happen to have too heavy layer of paint, then do you have to let it dry for like a week, five days? Well, if I put on too much paint, like too heavy, like right here, this is a hard edge. I don't want a hard edge here. Not at this stage. 
when I get to the final stages, I will mono hard edge, maybe. Um, Do you want Here. Um, is it okay? Okay. Um, so, if I get too much, that's a good question. But here, there's more paint. It's thicker in here, and that's where I'm going to be developing more of the focal point. Sort of. That's okay. I can, that'll take a little while to set up. But that's not too much um, because I kind of like what's happened here in that edge, and I don't want. I I want to keep it. But if I got too much on there and I didn't feel it was working, I'd take it off. All right. Um, because you can always add more paint. It's really hard to take off a lot of thick paint. If it gets too thick too, thick, too fast, then you're scraping, and then it changes the surface. And that's my. Um, you lose the effect of the technique that I'm showing you and how I do this. It's, it's not that I can't go in and fix it. It's just that this is all about working with soft edges and working in this very loose yet controlled way. Um, basically, these are just brushes. <laughs> okay. Um, How will you deal with the layering? Will you use the same techniques of the layering? Um, no, I'll paint that more direct. Sometimes I paint the land with a knife, mm -hmm. with the big really paintings. Important. Yeah, yeah, really Very different. Important. Very different, yeah. yeah. Um, I'll, I'll start, uh, if, everyone, if anybody wants to, I'll show you the, the next one. And the land is a little more developed. And it's, this was done with the brush. So before I, we can, you can always go back and ask me questions about this. Does anybody have a question about this that they want to ask at this initial stage before I switch? You can put this wherever you want to put it. Beautiful. To start. Okay. This is a piece that I've done four passages on. So um, you can see that there's a lot more development in the sky. I have really locked in my ground. I'm not touching the ground. The ground is done. Okay. All of this was done with a brush. Um, I did put in some th three-dimensionality along here, like this could be rows of trees or islands or something like that, so it's not just a straight horizon. But I left all of this, is, this is obviously a marsh, and I've, that's, that's staying the way it is, it's really not going anywhere. So here you've got light coming this way. Um, I've gone in, I've, I've done four, actually to, to, four total passages on this. All right, so. Um, you can see where I've got a lot of the cr different chromacity in the clouds, and I've also left, these were the radiance, Linda, that you were asking about. See how you, I'm getting these really strong, these really wonderful, vibrant colors? <laughs> the radiance give you that with a high key. Um, so certainly you can mix colors, but the radiance will give you something quite easy to go to, and there's, it's hard enough. <laughs> yes? How many passages are you calling the first one? One. One painting session. Okay, so I've done four painting sessions on this. So that is one painting session. This is initial painting session on that. Yeah. One. I'm going to let it dry. On your radiance, do you ever mix them or do you just do them straight from the tube? You can mix them. Oh, I mix them all the time. Okay. Yeah. Um, they're really strong. They don't look like they'd be strong, but they're really strong. Um, like the magenta it starts with planoprida. It's it's they're mixed. Yeah, they're all mixed with... Um, uh, they're not organic pigments, but they're all laboratory cleans, like quinacridones and things like that, yeah. with white. So you get a lot of tinting power. Of course, you could you could buy all these quinacridones and mix, but this is just easier. You know? <laughs> I mean, um, and it's um, and they're there. And they're pre-muted. They're pre-muted. Yes, they're pre-muted. Okay, so um, when I look at this, what I what first thing I want to do is is go in and key my sky a little bit better. So my light is coming from this way. So I want to work on maybe just darkening this down just a little bit. So we're going to do that first. I don't use any mediums. I'm using a little bit of the solvent. Um, another reason to let things dry down is that if you, if it's wet, and you put something with solvent on it, you're just going to lift off everything that you just put down. 
and defeat the purpose. Did you um, say why you decided to use the song? Um, because I can keep the layers really, really thin. If I'm glazing and putting using all that medium, first of all, it's it's, it's going to be turpentine, and it's going to be damar, and it's going to be all this stuff, and it's going to be thick like a brick. <laughs> okay, it's going to be this gooey, gooey painting, and that doesn't. What I'm doing, I don't have the same control over with the edges. If I have medium in this, this is going to be sticky. This is not going to be like honey in my paint, um, and I don't want that. That's a very good answer. I'm glad you said that. What I'm wondering is why you did the, the damsel, whatever it is, at this point. Why you don't? I haven't seen you do that very much. Put it into the, the thinner. I've been doing that all along. Have you not been? Yeah, <laughs> I've been doing it all along. Um, sometimes I'll just go straight into the paint because the, the Gamblin paints are really good for flow, so you don't really, it's not like Old Holland, which are thick, they're great paints, but they don't really work for this process. And they're not like some paints that are so runny and so full of oil that they're sliding all over the place. They, they just have a right amount of viscosity to them, and uh, they still set up. So, um, but you don't have to use this, but in this, I, if I go in, okay, I'll just show you, this is a good question. If I go in and try to darken this down, and I just use straight paint, I'm going to get a lot darker value very quickly, right? And I don't want that, because if I get too dark, then I'm just going to have to rub it out. So I, at this stage, I'm going in, and I want to work much more slowly, adding these layers, so they're not going to be as dark or maybe as opaque. But then I'm also, because I don't want to leave this hard edge in the sky where it looks like I swapped things with a paper towel, which is what I did do, um, I need to feather this into this part of the sky. Because when you look up at the sky, you don't, you don't see a line saying, this is part A, B, and C. This is a, you, you see it just sort of like a veil, like a gauze curtain. Right? You, don't, you just see it just sort of moving like that, seamless. So I can then go in and fuse different parts of my sky seamlessly. And you'll believe that that's sky. You won't believe me if I've got big opaque paint there. All right. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. All right. Good question. So I just went straight into my radiant blue for my sky here. And I'm going right in here with radiant blue without any solvent on it because I want the chroma. And I don't want to dilute at this stage. I want to add a little more oomph to this part of the painting. Now, if I decide that that's too dark, well, then I just go in and say I can remove a little bit of that. And that's where the subtractive process also comes in. So I can say, well, I think I just overstated that too much. And so I can thin it out just a little bit. And then when these two parts of the sky meet, I have to get them to relate to one another so they just sort of fall into one another, right? So you believe it. <laughs> so um, yeah, I'm working with very little pressure here. This is not like scrubbing your floor or your countertop or a pot or a pan. This is very, very light. And you can turn your towel and you work with these variegated edges so it's not just all solid. So you're only grabbing selective areas, so it's like little fingers, little soft fingers massaging the paint around. Um, okay, let's create a little more interest down here. It's looking a little weak.
So because this is dry, I can go over this with a transparent layer of some of this other paint and diffuse it, which I can't do when it's wet. So I could go in and say, I want this little area of cloud to be lighter. So you're just pushing some of that yellow white up I'm there. putting some of the yellow white right into it. And I can take care of the edge and I can also diffuse this whole area down here. I want this to be a lighter band. Now I may go, there's a painting on my website called Ascension. It's a 48 by 48. It uses this a lot and there are all these little fingers of light that come down. And I must have, on that particular painting, gone over those fingers probably 40 times, just again and again and again with different washes. Um, but they, it goes quickly. It's not, it's not, it sounds like, oh my, like a lot, but it's actually not. Um, because this could be dry in half an hour and I'd go back and then, because it's at this stage, this is wet, this is dry. I'm going in over something that is also dry, and then it'll set up very quickly if I keep it thin, and then I can go in and do another layer. How are you deciding which colors to use? I just look at the palette and I say, what, what do I want to use? And something just says, use the green. <laughs> Use the yellow. Um, I try not to think about it too much. I think about where do I want the light? I think what does it need? Is it looking too green? Is it looking this? Do I want to put this here? I've got, I want it, I'm looking at all this purple. I thought, well, I put a little orangey stuff in there. If I don't like it, I'll change it. Um, but I'm thinking warm and cool. I'm thinking light direction. I'm not thinking methodical. I'm not thinking locked in. It has to look this way. Um, when I finish this, this will, this will be, have a few layers over it so it won't be quite as chromatic, but it'll still be that greeny yellow. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the radiant um, red and the um, radiant green, and it's making a really interesting little gray. So there are these forms that sit on top of the larger forms, which we sort of did more in this first one, that are subforms. So when you get into these next passages, this is where you get to start playing with the subforms that sit on top of the bigger forms. And the most important thing just to remember with this is, where is my light direction? And also, what is important? What do I need to emphasize? What needs to fall off? The light is here. So these are top planes here that I'm hitting. The lights are going to turn and spill over the front of the cloud. So I'm hitting these little top planes to define some of those. So those are like the little ledges that move your eye down. You can also go in here, and these bands are looking a little too... stiff to me. So I'm taking some of that and moving some of that around. So your canvas is just a piece of canvas that's not on a board, is that correct? Well, this is unstretched, so I could transport it and demo for you, mm -hmm. rather than having it um, already you know, transporting it's just easier. Um, but when I do my big pieces, what I do is I have my framer build a support that's oversized. So if I have a finished size of 48 by 48, I'll do a 51 by 51 support. And then I paint all the way the edges. So I've got the, the gallery wrap will be painted all around. Mm -hmm. Then when they, I ship them unstretched to the gallery, they stretch. They will stretch to 48 by 48, but the painting will wrap around as a finished painting with just the continuity of the painting, so I allow for that. So 
if, um, I work with them stretched, but I, I have them overstretched for the finish size. So, so yeah, so what I would do, they wouldn't be on a board like this. This is just so I could transport it and right, demo for you. When it's finalized, it's going to go around. A so gallery wrap frame. Yeah, so if you stand to the side, you can still see the paint. Exactly, yeah. So it's not a black edge. And then when they stretch it, then I just mark my crop line, and then they stretch it. But that gives a cleaner look to it rather than, than trying to match a preconceived gray edge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or take a, a 36 by 36 and then stretch it to 33 by 33 because they want to gallery wrap it. And now I have a smaller painting that is not what I was initially wanting to achieve. Okay, So I just I have these big supports. I'm going to just move them back and forth. I have my framer stretch. I take this stuff off ship it out and then we restretch and it just keeps on going yeah so you take it off that 50 by 50 i take it off the 50 by 50. okay so he's just stapled it down he does a loose stretch so he doesn't do the edges it look like mouse ears he doesn't do the corners so he's not going to tighten it down and pull double the edges, pull right. the edges and all that he's going to stretch it tight enough so i can paint it so it's a good surface to paint on but he's not going to double staple and he's also not going to He's going to space his staples out more so I can get them out easily. And then there's always a lot more linen. There's a lot of linen in there on the back. So there's a lot of selvage. And there's a, so that way, there's, when they restretch it, right. they're not restretching it and then restapling it on the edge that's already been stapled. Right. They're going basically into almost a new edge. So. Um, and it doesn't distort your paintings. No. No, it doesn't. It's just like. Um, if you took this painting over here of riches, and then that was oversized for the finished size, and then you take it off, and then you roll it up, you ship it in a piece of PVC or tubing. I go to Lowe's and get a piece of Charlotte pipe, put cap the ends, take it to FedEx, whoosh, goes down, goes to the galleries. My galleries aren't local, and then they get their framework goes to their framer. They restretch, uh, they they build the supports, they restretch it, and it doesn't hurt it at all. It goes, it's beautiful. It's actually an so easier you know way. Right, and right. you're not going to put anything important on the edges. Exactly, which you shouldn't put anything important on the edges anyway. So it's, it's very good training to keep yourself working, uh, knowing that I've got, you know, sir, if, this, if this were going to be stretched, that um, going around to support, that I'm going to lose this much of the painting. All right. So if I've got a really critical relationship happening over here, I need to compensate for that. So I have to be thinking about it. But um, you just have to... Adjust the way you think a little bit, but it's not a lot. It's not like what it's feet. What percentage are you doing gallery wraps on? All my stuff I ship out, I'm gallery wrapping, except the small pieces. So they're all gallery wrap. Cool. So um, it just makes a lot more sense. And Very much cheaper that way, too. Mm -hmm. Well, and then uh, I have one gallery that sometimes they decide to frame the pieces, and they frame it, and then that's just part of their um, what they do. But most of it is gallery wrapped, and if the client wants to frame it, they can frame it. Um, it's pretty much built into the price. So um, I don't get billed for it. Um, one gallery I pay for it up front is quite reasonable. It's a lot cheaper than packing it up in a box and shipping a 48 by 48 in a box. That's really a 